So, today we're going to start talking about insight meditation. And in particular, the form of insight meditation that I most strongly encourage developing is the perception of impermanence. Um, so, to give a little bit of background around the subject, uh, I've selected three suttas. Um, and I'll read through the suttas and talk a bit about what they mean. And then I'll go into more description about the practice of the perception of impermanence. And so the first sutta here is the Upada Sutta from the Anguttara Nikaya, uh, Book of the Threes, Sutta number 137. <clears throat> so the title means arising or appearing. Monks, so the Buddha's talking, and apparently he's talking to monks at this time. So the, the sutta begins, Monks, whether Tathagatas arise or not, this aspect of the world remains the same, this stable truth, this fixed truth. All conditional things are impermanent. A Tathagata awakens to that and realizes that. Having awakened to it and realized it, he announces it, teaches it, describes it, expresses it, reveals it, explains it, and clarifies it. All conditional things are impermanent. So, what this is, uh, and there's, there's two more paragraphs, but I'm going to talk a bit about this before we move on. So, what the Buddha is pointing to here, first off, just with the, the opening statement, uh, whether Tathagatas arise or not. So a Tathagata is a uh, awakened being, a fully awakened being. Um, so uh, whether there's a Buddha present in the world or not, uh, then the, the basic principles of the world remain the same. Uh, so they don't change. So it's not like the Buddha comes into being and then changes the nature of the world. And it's not that after a Buddha passes away that the world changes again, but rather that the basic principles of the world are the same, regardless of whether or not there's a Buddha there to explain it. So all the Buddha does is recognize the uh, fundamental principles uh, of the world and explain them. And in particular, he explains those principles of the world which are necessary to understand if we wish to attain awakening. Um, so, uh, he says, uh, this aspect of the world remains the same. This stable truth, this fixed truth. In Pali, that's dhamma titata, dhamma niyamata. So this, uh, and I, that's translated in, in many different ways. Uh, here I translated Dhamma simply as truth. So a uh, Dhamma in its most basic, broad meaning, uh, Dhamma means things as they are, the way things are. Uh, and Titata means uh, stability. Uh, so the, this stability of the way things are. So this stable truth, things as they are. This fixed truth, so Dhamma Niyamata. Niyamata means fixity like uh, unchanging, uh, it doesn't alter in any way. So what he's saying is that uh, at all times, past, present, and future, in all places, uh, regardless of whether or not there's any Buddhas around, this is still always the same. Uh, all conditional things are impermanent. And realistically, we can actually simplify that a little bit to simply saying all things are impermanent. Uh, there's a particular reason why we use the word conditional. So what's translated as conditional things is the word sankhara. Um, who here is familiar with the word sankhara? Okay, then you already know of the difficulties involved in translating this word, I assume. Um, there is no agreed upon translation for the word sankhara because there's no English word that sums it up particularly well. So in, in defining sankhara, you realistically need at least a paragraph, not a word. So sankhara, uh, in its simplest meaning, uh, if we just take the pieces of the word, sang means together, kara means making uh, or doing. So sankhara is something that's been put together, something that's been constructed, concocted, fabricated. Uh, 
happens. So a sankara is anything that's, that's put together, uh, anything artificial or constructed. Uh, it's anything which is made up of other things or in dependence on other things. So a sankara is something which is not capable of existing independently. Something which can only exist in relation to other things. This is why it's commonly translated as conditional phenomena or conditional things. Uh, because sankaras, as they are made up of and reliant upon other things, they cannot exist on their own. Uh, they only exist in terms of their relationship to other things. So, uh, the cat is a sankara. Uh, this bell is a sankara. I am a sankara. Uh, you are all sankaras. Uh, the, the thoughts in our mind are sankaras. Our emotions are sankaras. Uh, the ideas that we have are sankaras. Our memories are sankaras. Everything, no, everything, everything is a sankara. Uh, everything is a conditional object, in that it, it relies upon its relationship to other things in order to exist, in order to have any relevance, in order to have any meaning. So, basically every single thing we experience is a sankara, it's a conditional phenomenon, a conditional thing. Um, the only phenomenon that cannot be described as conditional is nirvana. So nibbana is not a sankara. Everything else is. Okay? Is that clear enough? So sansara and all of its contents are sankaras. Nibbana is not a sankara. That's it. Everything else is a sankara. And technically speaking, nibbana is not a thing. Uh, but we'll go into that later at some point. Um, so uh, all conditional things are impermanent. So impermanent, that means... Uh, in its simplest meaning, impermanent means it's constantly changing. It doesn't stay the same. Not even for a moment does it stay the same. So nothing has any ongoing permanence. So nothing is the same from moment to moment. Everything changes from moment to moment. I assume you're smiling because of the joy arising at hearing words of Dhamma. I get the same way. Yeah, I don't blame you. Just look, look at this gigantic grin when he hears about all things constantly changing. Um, well, and that's actually the way of things. Uh, there's, it, it might be in one of the other suttas I have. Uh, but when we reflect on the constant change of all phenomena, the natural tendency of the mind is to become extremely happy, extremely joyful. Which is contrary to what we'd expect. We would expect that reflecting on everything constantly changing, being impermanent, subject to cessation, and so on, you'd think that would be disturbing. And when we just think about it, it seems perhaps even frightening. But when it's our experience, it's not frightening at all. It's enormously peaceful. Uh, it's very settling to the mind. It brings up a lot of joy in the mind. Anyway, so all things are constantly changing. Nothing has any ongoing, persistent existence. Um, so that's a concept, but it's a concept which is meant to be experienced, it's meant to be recognized. So he says here, uh, a Tathagata awakens to that and realizes that. So a Tathagata awakens to the truth that all th conditional things are impermanent, everything is impermanent, and realizes it. So the word translated as realize uh, is Sachi Karoti. And Sachi Karoti uh, is composed of three parts. Sa, which means, uh, actually it's uh, Sachi Karoti. Uh, the prefix here is actually a contraction of Sayang, which means uh, your own. Uh, Aki, which means I, and Karoti, uh, to make or to do. So literally, Sachi Karoti means to, to see it with your own eyes. Uh, so it's it's not just that someone tells uh, a Buddha, oh, all things are impermanent, and the Buddha's like, gotcha. No, it's he sees it with his own eyes. It's his own direct experience. So this term, Sachi Karoti, which is usually translated simply as realize, uh, literally means to see with your own eyes. And its, it's applied meaning then is 
to know it through direct experience. So a Buddha knows through direct experience that all things are impermanent. Having awakened to it and realized it, he announces it, teaches it, describes it, expresses it, reveals it, explains it, and clarifies it. All conditional things are impermanent. So a Buddha simply recognizes the way things are and explains it to the rest of us who do not recognize the way things are. To the rest of us who are mired in one degree of delusion or another. So uh, anyone who's not fully awakened, still has some belief in permanence, some belief in persistent existence. Now the layer, uh, the, the extent to which we have a belief in persistent existence depends upon each particular person. And also what we believe in as having persistent existence varies from person to person. Um, so your, your ordinary untaught worldling uh, a suttava patujana. Um, she's laughing because she knows this term. Uh, it's one of the delicious words that the Buddha uses. Uh, he, he talks about the asuttava patujana, like the unlearned ordinary person, and then the suttava arya savaka, the the learned disciple of the noble ones. Uh, so this uh, these these two opposites, these two different kinds of beings. So most people are asuttava patujana. Um, so like uh, virtually all my family members, for example, as much as I love them, they're, they're all patujanas. Um, <laughs> and hopefully all of us are either arya savakas or trying to become arya savakas. Uh, so there's, there's also some debate about the proper meaning of the word arya savaka. Um, so uh, I'm personally in the camp of those who translate Arya Savaka as disciple of the noble ones. Uh, because the way the Buddha uses it throughout the suttas is to indicate that it's referring to people who are trying to attain enlightenment, uh, as well as those who do. Um, it's also sometimes translated as noble disciple, but uh, again, I'm, I'm not quite on board with that because that implies someone who's already enlightened. So in the suttas, a noble one is someone who's attained enlightenment or some, some degree of awakening. Uh, so uh, we're trying to not be patujanas, and we're trying to be arya savakas. Uh, are we all on board? Okay. The fact that you came to this retreat is already a really good sign. It's a sign that you may be in the camp of the arya savakas. You might not be, but there's a good chance of it. Okay, what was I talking about? Before I got off on that side trail. Uh, let's see, having awakened to it and realized it, he announces it, teaches it, describes it, expresses it, reveals it, explains it, and clarifies it. So, we, uh, anyone who's not fully awakened has some attachment to permanence. So your ordinary, mm, untaught, ordinary person uh, tends to have a very broad, wide-reaching perception of permanence. Uh, they see this floor as permanent, they see their body as permanent, they see their mind as permanent, they see their personality as permanent, they see their preferences as permanent, they see their relationships as permanent. And all this creates an enormous amount of suffering. Because none of that is permanent. Not one bit of it is permanent. It's all in constant flux. So trying to hold on to something that's constantly changing is quite uncomfortable. It's not a pleasant experience at all. And there's also that constant dissonance, that constant break with reality, in that uh, we're stuck on, uh, since we're stuck on the belief in permanence, um, if something's permanent, then you only need to learn what it is once, and then you're done with learning about it for the rest of your life. Uh, so if you believe in something as permanent, then you'll get a single perception of it, and then you'll stop paying attention, because you don't need to pay attention. Meanwhile, that thing is changing, which means your perception in your mind is getting farther and farther away from the truth, assuming it ever was remotely close to the truth in the first place, which is doubtful. Uh, but assuming it was anywhere close to truth in the first place, it'll just keep getting farther and farther away from the truth as time goes by. Classic example of this is with our own age. 
Uh, so most of us start life with the perception of being young. Well, uh, you might even form a self-identity, like, I am a young person. And if we hold on to that without constantly updating our perception, then eventually one day we'll go and, and try to pick something up, thinking, I am a young person, and throw our back out, because we're not young anymore. Or we'll look in the mirror thinking, I'm, I'm a young person, and going like, Jesus, who's that old man looking back at me? Um, uh, or we'll, we'll have some experience where, where we meet someone and we're like, Hello, how are you? And they'll be like, Get away from me, old man. And we'll be like, What? But I'm a young man. Oh, wait, no, I'm not. Not anymore. So there's that, that dissonance. Um, and, and this comes up in all kinds of ways. A major example of this in t is in terms of how we relate to other people. Uh, so we meet someone, and we form an opinion of, of their personality. Uh, so we, we think, okay, this person has these characteristics, they're uh, friendly, they're funny, they're smart, uh, they're uh, timely. Uh, and, and maybe at the time, maybe that's true, but people are constantly changing, just like everything else. Uh, so then uh, we encounter them again, and now they're being uh, stupid, boring, and constantly late. And we're just like, what is this? This isn't the person that I thought you were. And, and the reason for that is not anything to do with them, but it's because we were stuck on a perception of permanence, a perception of things as being unchanging. So these are ordinary external examples of how we interact with the outside world. Uh, but more important is in terms of how we relate to our own body and mind. And most important is how we relate to our self-identity, how we relate to who and what we think we are. So we think, uh, on, its, on its outermost layer, we think this body is stable, this body is permanent, this body is, is unchanging. And that very quickly becomes evidently false, very quickly becomes clear that the body is constantly changing. Though, without closely focusing the mind, we still tend to have a perception of permanence in relation to the body. Even though on an intellectual level we know the body is constantly changing, our moment-by-moment -moment experience is of a solid, unchanging body. We expect our body to be about the same now as it was yesterday. We expect our body to be about the same now as it was ten minutes ago. We expect our body to, do, to be about the same now as it was a moment ago. This is all totally wrong. Our body is not the same as it was yesterday. It's not the same as it was ten minutes ago. It's not the same as it was even half a second ago. So, uh, then part of our, our practice then is of continually re-updating our experience. Continually observing what actually is the experience right now. What actually is the experience of the body? And when we pay very close attention, then again, what we notice is not stability, solidity, or permanence. What we notice is constant change. So this, uh, this starts to break down uh, some of the ways that we make suffering for ourselves, uh, some of the ways that we make ourselves unhappy. Um, and then applying these perceptions to the mind, uh, this is where it starts to get a lot more personal um, and can be a lot more uncomfortable. Is when we recognize uh, that all the contents of our mind are impermanent and constantly changing. Um, all of our personality traits are impermanent and constantly changing. All of our ideas and memories are impermanent and constantly changing. All of our experiences and perceptions are impermanent and constantly changing. Even the quality of our awareness, uh, even consciousness itself, is impermanent and constantly changing. So none of it can be who or what we are. And none of it can ultimately be satisfying or enjoyable, because all of it is uh, it's temporary. It's there for an instant and then gone. So we can't get any lasting satisfaction out of anything. And we also can't rely upon anything, whether internal or external, as a source of happiness. So when we recognize that, then there's no problem, because we just stop trying to find satisfaction 
and temporary changing things. Why would you, why would you even try? We recognize it's absurd, so we stop trying. And when we stop trying, then we stop failing. And when we stop failing, then we stop suffering. Similarly, uh, when we recognize that uh, all of the uh, components of our body are constantly changing, and that therefore none of them is essential to our identity, then we stop identifying as or with the body. And then whatever happens to the body no longer has the ability to upset us or disturb us, because we know it's not who we are. And similarly with the mind. Um, uh, one of my since departed relatives uh, placed a great deal of solace in her memories, in what she could remember, in remembering uh, all the things she had done in her life and all the things her uh, children and grandchildren had done. And then as she started to get towards the end of her life, she started losing her memory. And this was extremely upsetting to her because her primary source of happiness was in going through her memories. So when she started to lose her memory, she no longer had a source of solace and contentment. She was not Buddhist, by the way, if you haven't picked up on that by now. Um, and she clearly was not practicing Buddhism. Uh, but this is a very common thing. So instead, if we recognize that uh, memories are impermanent, unreliable, and subject to change, then we won't try to base our happiness on our memories. And we'll also recognize memories are not who we are. Uh, they're just objects that come and go. And the same with everything else in the mind, whether it's emotions or personality traits or ideas or ways of perceiving the world or ways of experiencing the mind. We recognize that all of that as well is temporary, impermanent, not fixed, not reliable, and ultimately subject to change. So none of that can be who we are either. So the experience of self-existence is independent of all of these specific things. So none of these specific things is essential to who we are, essential to what we are. So when we recognize this, then we can let go of attachment to such things. We can let go of identity built on such things, which again sheds an enormous amount of our suffering. It's letting go of uh, an enormous amount of our discontent. Uh, there's one sutta which, it's not here, uh, in this pile, there's one sutta where the Buddha says, uh, oh, how's it go? Dukameva upajanto upajati, dukameva nirujanto nirujati. It is only dukkha that arises and only dukkha that ceases. Big smile, big smile. <laughs> it is only dukkha that arises, it is only dukkha that ceases. Okay, apparently I'm the only one who loves that one. Um, so that, that's actually meant to be extraordinarily comforting uh, in conjunction with impermanence. It's like, well, because all things are subject to arise and cease. That can be a little upsetting if we think that the things that are arising and ceasing are satisfying and enjoyable. But when we recognize that it's only dukkha arising and ceasing, then we just completely lose interest. Why would we want to get wrapped up in the constant spinning cycles of dukkha? Who would voluntarily take on the, am I allowed to use profanity on Facebook Live? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the excrement storm. Who would voluntarily enter the excrement storm? <laughs> <laughs> so when we recognize it's just dukkha arising and dukkha ceasing, dukkha arising, dukkha ceasing, it's like, why on earth would I fling myself into that mess? So we don't. We step back from it. So, this is also what the Buddha is pointing to. Um, so, I'll, I'll go ahead and finish reading this so that it, it, it adds a little bit to this that's quite relevant. The Buddha continues, Monks, whether Tathagatas arise or not, this aspect of the world remains the same. This stable truth, this fixed truth. All conditional things are unsatisfactory. A Tathagata awakens to that and realizes that. 
Having awakened to it and realized it, he announces it, teaches it, describes it, expresses it, reveals it, explains it, and clarifies it. All conditional things are unsatisfactory. Monks, whether Tathagatas arise or not, this aspect of the world remains the same. This stable truth, this fixed truth. All things are impersonal. A Tathagata awakens to that and realizes that. Having awakened to it and realized it, he announces it, teaches it, describes it, expresses it, reveals it, explains it, and clarifies it. All things are impersonal. So, uh, altogether then, this forms the three universal characteristics, which are all interrelated. Yeah, and they're three basic characteristics of all phenomena. So, all things are impermanent, unsatisfying, and impersonal. Anicca, dukkha, anatta. Impermanent, unsatisfying, impersonal. So this forms the basic framework for insight meditation. Insight meditation is all about developing a direct experience of these three truths. A direct experience of these three characteristics. So right now we have it as an idea in our mind. So we have this idea, oh yeah, all things are impermanent, unsatisfactory, and impersonal. But then we keep going around acting as though things are permanent, satisfying, and personal. Which is why we suffer so much. So we think this body is reliable and stable, it's a great source of pleasant sensations, and it's me. And then what happens? Uh, then uh, we go to a restaurant and the food is it's kind of good, but not amazing, and then we get food poisoning, and, and then we're feeling kind of sick, and, and, well, what's the problem here? Technically, nothing's a problem. The problem is that we assumed that we could find uh, reliable happiness through the body. Uh, we assumed that the body was who we are, and that, therefore, its illness is so upsetting and distressing to us. Uh, so it's... Uh, it's based upon this basic failure to recognize the truth of impermanence and the automatic implications of unsatisfactoriness and uh, the impersonal nature of phenomena. So, that's a brief introductory sutta. Um, I spent a lot longer on that than I was planning to. Um, here's a little secret, I don't really plan things. Uh, I just start talking and see what happens. Okay, so, uh, there's two other suttas to talk about here. Um, and I haven't, on the, the subject of not planning things, I hadn't actually planned which sutta I was going to read first. We'll start with this one. What? So, uh, this is from the Sanyutta Nikaya, chapter 22, sutta number 122, called the Silavanta Sutta, which is the discourse about the virtuous one. On one occasion, Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Mahakotita were living at Varanasi in the deer park at Isipatana. Then in the evening, Venerable Mahakotita emerged from retreat, approached Venerable Sariputta, and said to him, Venerable Sariputta, what phenomena are to be paid wise attention to by a virtuous monk? Um, for those who don't know, Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Mahakotita were two of the Buddha's main disciples, both of whom were fully enlightened. So when they talk, pay attention. They know what they're talking about. Um, so while most of the suttas that we have are things the Buddha said, a handful of them are things that his uh, enlightened disciples said. Um, also, I should point out here, it, it says in this translation, what phenomena are to be paid wise attention to? Uh, the word translated here as phenomena is dhamma, which as I mentioned earlier, in its broadest sense means uh, things as they are, or truths. Slightly more specific, it means things, uh, like phenomena, so in that sense, like uh, the cat is a dhamma, the bell is a dhamma, and so on, similar to sankharas. Um, and then more specific dhamma means teachings. So you could translate this, what teachings are to be paid attention to, um, or what things are to be paid attention to, uh, or what characteristics are to be paid attention to, 
These are all valid ways of, of translating this phrase. So keeping that in mind. Now we move on to one of my favorite statements in the entire Pali canon. We'll see if anybody other than Drager smiles at this one. Uh, Sariputta replies, Venerable Kotita, a virtuous monk is to wisely pay attention to the five components of attachment as... So five components of attachment are body and mind. Just so we're all on the same page. A virtuous monk is to wisely pay attention to the five components of attachment as impermanent, unsatisfactory, disease, cancer, stabbing, misfortune, affliction, alien, disintegrating, empty, and impersonal. Okay, not even Drager smiled at that one. That's a bad sign. Um, this is meditation instructions right here. Pay close attention. This is the Buddha giving very specific, direct meditation instructions. Well, Venerable Sariputta giving specific meditation instructions. What are the five? The physical form component of attachment, the feeling component of attachment, the recognition component of attachment, the thought component of attachment, and the consciousness component of attachment. <coughs> Venerable Kotita, a virtuous monk is to wisely pay attention to these five components of attachment as impermanent, unsatisfactory, disease, cancer, stabbing, misfortune, affliction, alien, disintegrating, empty, and impersonal. Okay, that's better. Somebody gets it. Venerable, it is possible that a virtuous monk who wisely pays attention to these five components of attachment as impermanent, unsatisfactory, disease, Cancer, stabbing, misfortune, affliction, alien, disintegrating, empty, and impersonal can realize the fruit of stream entry. Yes, yes. <laughs> now you understand why he's saying this creepy stuff. Um, it's not just to be creepy. He's saying it because this is a direct path to awakening. It's a direct path to enlightenment. So, the five components of attachment... Um, it's often translated as, instead of component, the word, the word you usually see is aggregate. Does anybody, other than people who work with minerals and stones, does anybody else know what the word aggregate means? Okay, hardly anyone. Who has actually seen the word aggregate used in ordinary language at any point? Again, very few people. That's because it's a very rare word that is almost never used outside of technical contexts. So I don't know how that came to be used. It's so a Latin, Italian, in Italian you use it all the time. Actually. Oh, not in English. Because it comes from Latin. I mean, it's like <laughs> aggregate is like a collection yeah. of stuff that's not well, very esoteric. Well, it is, but it's not used particularly frequently. Yeah. I'm not a good person to ask about frequency of usage. Fair enough. <laughs> Check it on the OED. All the Latin <laughs> originated words are not Okay, so used. back on track now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So, long story short, I don't like the word aggregate. <laughs> um, taking my stand on personal preference, uh, since I failed on appeal to authority. Um, so, component. The, the five, uh, kanda is the Pali word, kanda, uh, or skanda in Sanskrit. It's referring to the five components of personal existence. So, what do we think of as me? We think of our body, uh, we think of our feelings, uh, we think of our uh, recognition process or our perception process, uh, we think of our thoughts, our emotions, our ideas, our memories, uh, and we think of our consciousness, our awareness. That's what we think of as me. So, these are the five components of personal existence. So, the body uh, encompasses all physical things. Um, so, in the context of, of personhood, it refers to our physical body. But in, occasionally, in some places, the Buddha uses it in a broader sense to mean all physical things. Uh, but here we're particularly talking about our body, what we think of as our body. A feeling, which is a Vedana in Pali, so uh, body or physical form is rupa, Rupa. Uh, feeling is Vedana. Feeling refers to whether any experience is pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. 
So it's the basic tone of an experience, not its details, but just its basic tone. Is it pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral? So, uh, sanya, the third one, sanya, uh, I translate here as recognition. Sanya is the process through which we decide what something is, and uh, not only do we, do we decide what something is, but that then we project the experience that we've decided we're having. Um, so, for example, uh, uh, we look at something. Uh, like uh, a classic example of this is when something comes into the corner of your eye. So currently there's only a very vague, fuzzy image. There's not enough visual information to clearly identify what it is. But it comes into the corner of our eye and based on ideas or memories or prejudices or whatever we have in our mind, then we decide what it is and we'll actually project an image there. So something comes into the corner of our eye and we'll be like, oh, there's a rabbit. Why on earth is there a rabbit in the meditation hall? That's weird. And we're actually seeing a rabbit over here. Then we turn to look and we're like, no, it's not a rabbit, it's a hand. But for that initial moment, we're actually seeing a rabbit out of the corner of our eye. That's the function of sanya. Sanya is the, the process through which we decide what it is we're seeing and then rewrite our sensory information to match what we've decided. We're doing this all the time. So we're not living in the outside world. We're living in our own internal world, which resembles the outside world. I'm actually doubtful about the existence of this whole outside world thing. Um, realistically, none of us has ever experienced the outside world. None of us has ever experienced objective reality. We only ever experience subjective reality. We only ever experience our own mental world, which we assume is based on something outside. So that's a minor side point, uh, but it's relevant here because this, this process of sanya is how we build our world. It's how we build our experience of the world, moment by moment. Um, then the, the fourth component is uh, sankhara. Here again we encounter the word sankhara. Here it has the more specific meaning of mental constructs. So rather than constructs in the broadest sense of encompassing all things, this is specifically mental constructs. So, thoughts and emotions and moods and um, so on. Ideas and memories and all that. Uh, and then the, the fifth one is consciousness, which is vijnana in Pali. Vijnana is the experience of a world. Uh, so like eye consciousness is the experience of a visual world. Um, ear consciousness is the experience of an auditory world uh, and so on. So these are the five components of existence, uh, the five, uh, and so with these five, then we have everything that we think of as me. This includes everything, so nothing can be left out. So if you can find something that's not included in one of the five, let me know. Um, to date, I haven't encountered anything. But if you come up with something, I'm happy to, to listen to what you have to say. You won't find anything. But if you somehow <laughs> did, please let me know, that would be interesting. Um, and it specifies here also component of attachment. Uh, so the issue here with the five components is not the components themselves, but rather that we have some measure of desire, attachment, obsession, um, aversion, irritation, rejection, etc. in relation to them. Uh, so we're attached to our body. We don't want anything harmful to happen to our body. We're attached to our memories. We don't want to lose them, as in the case of the, uh, the relative I mentioned. Um, she was very attached to her memories, so she was very upset when she started losing them. We're very attached to our bodies, so we're upset when the body gets injured. Um, we're attached to pleasant sensations, so we're upset when we feel unpleasant sensations, and so on. Uh, so, the, the difference between an unawakened being and an awakened being, so they both have the five components, the difference is that for an awakened being there's no attachment involved. They just recognize body and mind as just being parts of 
the universe, just being part of samsara. Uh, there's no attachment, there's no clinging, there's no liking or disliking, it's just recognizing it for what it is. The same as you look at a tree and you just recognize a tree for being what it is. It has a trunk, it has branches, it has leaves. It's just what it is. Those are the components of a tree. In the same way, an awakened being looks at their body and mind and just recognizes, oh, there's body, there's feeling, there's recognition, and so on. Uh, but there's no, uh, there's no problem there. They just recognize that's the components of a person. So, uh, then the Buddha, uh, well, Sariputta in this case, though uh, in other suttas we find the same um, instructions given by the Buddha. Um, so I'm just going to keep saying the Buddha because it's easier that way. Uh, so we find the same instructions given by the Buddha elsewhere. Um, so here it says, uh, a virtuous monk or a virtuous layperson or a virtuous nun or a virtuous anyone who wants to attain awakening is to wisely pay attention to these five components of attachment as impermanent, unsatisfactory, disease, cancer, stabbing, misfortune, affliction, alien, disintegrating, empty, and impersonal. So this is how to practice the perception of impermanence. Uh, this is one way of approaching it. And you'll notice he also wraps in uh, the other two characteristics, the characteristics of all things being unsatisfactory and all things being impersonal. So that's included here as well. So this list neatly sums up uh, a way to approach all three universal characteristics. Um, and it's important when we develop these perceptions not to be using them with a mind of aversion or hostility. The purpose here is not to hate your body or to hate your mind, but rather it's to have dispassion and disenchantment. It's to recognize that body and mind are not a suitable basis for identity. They're not a suitable basis for saying, this is me. They're not a suitable basis for seeking happiness and pleasure. Um, because that's absolutely futile. And it can't be done. So then when we recognize that, then we let go of that futile, agitated pursuit of an impossible reality. And instead we accept things exactly as they are. And accepting things exactly as they are, seeing things exactly as they are, <coughs> is an experience of peace, joy, and mental clarity, which is what we're aiming at in our Buddhist practice. Um, the one that I find particularly delightful in this list is, well, actually all of them are great, but the one disintegrating I particularly like. Uh, and so, for example, drawing one's attention to the body, uh, establishing mindfulness of the body, concentrating very closely on our physical sensations, and then notice that moment by moment, every single physical experience disintegrates. Every single sensation disintegrates. It's gone. It ceases to be. And then the next moment, there's something else, and that disintegrates as well. The next moment, there's something else, and that disintegrates as well. So noticing cessation, noticing disintegration, noticing things coming to an end, which is every single moment. You don't have to wait any amount of time. It's always immediate. It's always right now. Um, viewing body and mind as a disease. Uh, this one, again, needs to be done carefully because it's easy to fall into hating body and mind, which is not the point. Um, hating it is just another form of attachment. But rather, uh, it's recognizing that uh, if something is a disease, that's not who we want to be, and that's not something we want to have. So it's working to shift our usual perception of body and mind as uh, a reliable source of pleasure. Because it's not. That's never been our experience throughout our lives. Our experience of, our, of the body and mind has never been one of reliable pleasure. Sometimes more so than others. But never everlasting, completely reliable, 
completely 100% satisfying, ever. It's never been that way. So uh, perceiving the body as uh, misfortune, as an affliction. Uh, so uh, again, the affliction here is not the body itself. The body itself is perfectly fine. The affliction is our distorted relationship to body and mind. The body is just part of the universe, and that doesn't change, uh, properly speaking. But our relation to it is based upon uh, obsession, desire, attachment, aversion, and that creates constant affliction. So it's our a uh, relationship to body and mind based upon desire and aversion that makes it an affliction. So perceiving, uh, perceiving the five components as an affliction. So I won't go into a lot of detail on this because you can use your creativity and come up with all kinds of deliciously creative ways of practicing with this set of perceptions. So just wrapping up the sutta briefly. Oh, and also, he ends by saying that one who develops these perceptions can realize the fruit of stream entry. So stream entry is the first irreversible stage of awakening. Uh, so it's so-called because, so a stream that flows towards the ocean, if you throw something into the stream, then that thing will be carried inevitably out to the ocean. It might take some time, but it will inevitably reach the ocean. So similarly, when we enter the stream of Dhamma, then we will inevitably arrive at Nibbana. We will inevitably reach awakening. It might take some time, but we will inevitably get there eventually. So, Mahakotita asks, But, Venerable Sariputta, what phenomena are to be paid wise attention to by a monk who is a stream enterer? Sariputta replies, Venerable Kotita, a monk who is a stream enterer is also to wisely pay attention to the five components of attachment as impermanent, unsatisfactory, disease, cancer, stabbing, misfortune, affliction, alien, disintegrating, empty, and impersonal. Also alien. Viewing your body and mind as alien is another really fun one. Um, so viewing it as somebody else's body and mind. That can be fun. So just as you look at somebody else and you're like, that's not my body, that's his body. Look at this body the same way. This isn't my body. This doesn't belong to me. This is somebody else's. It's not mine. Um, Venerable, it is possible that a monk who is a stream enterer that wisely pays attention to these five components of attachment as impermanent, unsatisfactory, disease, cancer, stabbing, misfortune, affliction, alien, disintegrating, empty, and impersonal can realize the fruit of one's return. Um, another notable element on, the li on this list, by the way, is empty. So the Pali word here is sunyata. Uh, so um, every now and then one encounters the misinformation that there's no talk about emptiness or sunyata in the Pali canon. There is. It's all over the place. I don't know where this idea came from because it's everywhere. Uh, it, it, it isn't gone into in as much detail as we see in the Mahayana uh, scriptures that came later. But it's all over the place in the Pali Canon, and this is one place where the Buddha directly mentions sunyata, directly mentions emptiness. So the, the fruit of once return. So a once returner is someone who, uh, it's a stream enterer who has weakened sensual desire and aversion to the point where their uh, bondage to human existence is extremely weak. It's extremely minimal. Um, so there's very little desire for sensuality, uh, which means there's very little that draws the person towards human existence. So a once returner is someone who, at most, will return to human existence one more time. Um, so that if they come to human existence one more time, they've already weakened sensual desire to the point where any further experience will be enough to sever that completely. So, Kotita asks, Venerable Sariputta, what phenomena are to be paid wise attention to by a monk who is a once-returner? Venerable Kotita, a monk who is a once-returner is also to wisely pay attention to the five components of attachment as impermanent, unsatisfactory, disease, cancer, stabbing, misfortune, affliction, alien, disintegrating, empty, and impersonal. 
If he does so, then he can realize the fruit of non-return. So a non-returner is one who has completely eliminated <laughs> sensual desire and aversion. So there's absolutely nothing that can bring them to human existence. So since human existence is inherently sensual, there must be some amount of sensual desire present in the mind in order to pull one to the state of being. So a non-returner, since they're not fully enlightened, they continue to have personal existence, independent individual existence, but not as a human. Uh, instead, they, uh, they can be reborn as a deva, uh, in, generally speaking, in uh, one of the suddhavasa, the, the pure abodes, um, at which, uh, and in that place, then they'll attain enlightenment at some point. Um, so then Kotita asks, but Venerable Sariputta, what phenomena are to be paid wise attention to by a monk who is a non-returner? He replies, Venerable Kotita, a monk who is a non-returner is also to wisely pay attention to the five components of attachment. Is anyone getting tired of this by now? <laughs> Personally, I love it. Um, is anybody hating this? Be honest. No one? Great. Every now and then I meet someone who hates Buddhism. So I'm glad you're not one of them. <laughs> Uh, a monk who is a non-returner is also to wisely pay attention to the five components of attachment as impermanent, unsatisfactory, disease, cancer, stabbing, misfortune, affliction, alien, disintegrating, empty, and impersonal. By doing, by doing so, he can realize the fruit of arhat. He can become an arhat. So an arhat is a fully awakened being. Kotita asks, But, Venerable Sariputta, what phenomena are to be paid wise attention to by a monk who is an arhat? Venerable Kotita, a monk who is an arhant is also to wisely pay attention to the five components of attachment as impermanent, unsatisfactory, disease, cancer, stabbing, misfortune, affliction, alien, disintegrating, empty, and impersonal. Venerable, it is not that there is anything more for an arhant to do or to accumulate. However, when these are developed and cultivated, they are conducive to a pleasant life here and now and to mindfulness and clear awareness. So I find this particularly uh, delightful in that, uh, so Venerable Kotita is asking about the practices that are necessary to attain each stage of awakening, and then also what to do after you attain awakening. And every step of the way, it's the same practice. <laughs> every step of the way, it's the perception of impermanence, the perception of unsatisfactoriness, and the perception that all things are impersonal. That's what we do every step of the way, for every stage of enlightenment. It's the same. And then even after we attain enlightenment, we're still doing the same thing, because at that point, it's completely natural. Because at that point, we're fully in harmony with reality. So we no longer have any distortion. At that point, it's effortless. An awakened being doesn't need to actively bring up the perception of impermanence, because they just recognize that's how things are. They know that's how things are. Okay, so that's that sutta. <laughs> um, I'm getting the signal that I should keep going. More smiles, more nods. Okay, more smiles and nods, that's a good sign as well. Can you believe that some people actually don't like the suttas? I have no idea why. Uh, I just adore these, they're so delicious. Um, so this one is uh, the Attaka Nagara Sutta from the Majjhima Nikaya, Sutta number 52, the discourse to the man from Attaka city. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, Venerable Ananda was living at Vesali in Belava village. On this occasion, Dasama, a householder from Attaka city, had arrived at Pataliputta because of some business. Uh, so Pataliputta was a village nearby. Then Dasama went to the chicken park and approached a certain monk, paid respects to him and sat to one side. We also have a chicken park in the backyard. Uh, little friends. When he was seated to one side, Dasama said to that monk, Bhante, where does Venerable Ananda now live? We wish to see Venerable Ananda. So Venerable Ananda was the Buddha's 
um, main attendant. So Venerable Ananda was with the Buddha for most of the Buddha's teaching career and memorized everything the Buddha said. Um, and this sutta most likely takes place after the Buddha has passed away um, because of how they talk about the, the Buddha in the past tense and they never ask where he's currently living. Uh, so that implies that the Buddha had already passed away at this point. Which would also mean that Ananda at this point was fully enlightened. So Ananda did not attain full enlightenment during the Buddha's lifespan. Um, so he, he attained some degree of awakening, but he always had a certain degree of self-attachment um, until after the Buddha died. And then Ananda was like, this is so terrible. I spent all this time in the Buddha's presence and I never attained awakening and now he's dead. What am I going to do? This is, uh, I'm lost. Uh, and, uh, and so he'd been practicing very hard and, and he's finally like, okay, I give up. And he lies down to take a nap. And the moment his head hit the pillow, then he finally let go completely. He finally dropped attachment to self completely um, and attained awakening at that time. So this was shortly after the Buddha's death. So while it's not specified, um, based on these bits of evidence, most likely Venerable Ananda was enlightened at the time he was talking uh, in the sutta. So the monk, uh, the monk replies, Householder, Venerable Ananda lives at Vesali in Belava village. Then after Dasama had finished his business in Pataliputta, he went to Belava village in Vesali, approached Venerable Ananda, paid respects to him and sat to one side. When he was seated to one side, Dasama said to Venerable Ananda, Bhante Ananda, is there any one thing that was said by the Blessed One, the Knower, the Seer, the Arhant, the Fully Self-Awakened One, by means of which a vigilant, ardent, dedicated monk might liberate an unliberated mind, eliminate all the corruptions that have not yet been eliminated, and reach the unsurpassable freedom from bondage that has not yet been reached. Um, so, is everyone on board? Does that make sense? So he's asking, uh, what's one thing the Buddha says that we can use to attain enlightenment? That's what he's asking. <coughs> and Ananda replies, Householder, there is indeed one thing that was said by the Blessed One, the Knower, the Seer, the Arhant, the Fully Self-Awakened One, by means of which a vigilant, ardent, vigilant, ardent, Dedicated monk might liberate an unliberated mind. So liberate an unliberated mind. Like right now, all of our minds are not liberated. So through these practices, we can liberate our minds. Uh, eliminate all the corruptions that have not yet been eliminated. So we currently have the corruptions of uh, sensual, uh, sensual obsession. Um, let's see. Kamasava, Bhavasava, the corruption of obsession with existence, Bhavasava, Avijasava, the corruption of ignorance, and Dittasava, the corruption of attachment to viewpoints and opinions. Um, so we're aiming to eliminate all of those corruptions, all of those flaws. And reach the unsurpassable freedom from bondage. So the unsurpassable freedom from bondage, once again, is awakening, it's enlightenment. The only way we can be completely safe and free is to attain awakening. Bhante Ananda, what was the one thing uh, by means of which one might reach the unsurpassable freedom from bondage? And Ananda replies, Householder, secluded from sensuality and from unwholesome phenomena, a monk attains and remains in the first jhana, which has thought, examination, and the rapture and happiness born from seclusion. Does everyone know what the first jhana is? What jhana is at all? So jhana is uh, the stages of deep concentration. So when you focus your mind on an object and hold it there unwaveringly for an extended period of time, the mind can go into a state of a very deep, strong concentration, where the mind is not distracted at all. It stays completely focused on the object. Uh, and in that state, then, the mind, uh, the mind stays on its object and uh, a great deal of euphoria arises. 
So your body and mind feel absolutely fantastic, absolutely amazing. Um, and this is important to mention because it's not uncommon that somebody reaches that stage of concentration. They reach first jhana and they think, that's it, I've attained enlightenment, this must be it. This, uh, or they might recognize it's not enlightenment, but they just get so enamored with it. So the first time I had an experience of deep concentration, I was just in love. I was just like, this is just magnificent. All I had to do was just sit down for a few hours and focus my mind. Uh, and I could have the most incredible euphoria I've ever had in my life. It was just like, how could you not become obsessed with that? It's very easy to become so obsessed with it that we lose sight of a higher goal. We, we forget that there's something more wonderful beyond this. So, Ananda says, so after one attains first jhana, he reflects, this is the first jhana. It is conditional and volitional. Whatever is conditional and volitional is impermanent and will cease. Being stable in that perception, he reaches the elimination of the corruptions. Um, if he does not reach the elimination of the corruptions, then because of that passion for the Dhamma, because of that delight in the Dhamma, then with the complete elimination of the five lower fetters, he becomes a spontaneous reappearer. And there he will attain final nibbana without ever returning from that world. Householder, this is one thing by, by means of which one might reach the unsurpassable freedom from bondage. So explaining this in a bit more detail. So first off, uh, so one, one attains some deep concentration. One attains first jhana. Well, the first thing is to recognize that's what it is. This is not enlightenment. It's just jhana. Okay? Now, it feels amazing, and the mind is not distracted, uh, which for many of us is a very new experience. Um, but it's just concentration. It's nothing to get too obsessed with. So first recognizing what it is. It's first jhana. Then we recognize it is conditional. Uh, it, it came together because of specific conditions and circumstances. Uh, it's, which means it's not reliable. Um, it's volitional which means it's dependent upon having the intention in the mind to reach and remain in, in jhana. In other words, when our intentions change, then we'll lose jhana. Or if we don't have the intention in the first place, we can never get jhana. So it's recognizing that the experience is not stable, not reliable. And that whatever is conditional and volitional is impermanent and will cease. So it's recognizing that even while we're in the midst of this absolutely delicious euphoria and undistractedness, totally focused, uh, rapturous mind, normally our tendency in that case is just to bask in that rapture. Um, and basking in the rapture has uh, a certain place, which I might talk about at a later point, because that that can be useful to our practice to a limited extent. Um, but if we just bask in the rapture without doing any reflection or contemplation, then all we're actually doing is strengthening our attachment. We're strengthening our attachment to pleasure. Now, it's a relatively blameless happiness. It's a blameless pleasure. So the Buddha says that the pleasure that arises from jhana is blameless. It's not remotely harmful. But it is limited temporary and unreliable, so attachment to it is a source of suffering. Attachment to it is a source of dissatisfaction and discontent. Because things change, and things come to an end. So if our happiness is dependent upon jhana, then our happiness is not reliable. It's not dependable. Um, there's a further refinement here in, in the Pali text, which doesn't come through in translation. So what I translated here as, uh, it will cease. The Pali term is nirodha dhamma. So nirodha means cessation or ending, and dhamma means, uh, in this case it means the characteristic, or the nature. 
So it's saying that uh, anything that is conditional is impermanent and has the characteristic of cessation. It has the nature of cessation. So the reason why this is important is because it's present tense. It's not saying it has the nature to eventually cease. It's saying right here in the present moment it already has the characteristic of cessation. It already has the characteristic of non-existence. Um, so this is cutting right through the wrong view of substantialism, the wrong view that things have, uh, the wrong view that things exist in some solid, real way. So he's saying here that even right in the present moment, even when something appears to be real, it's not quite real. Even when something appears to exist, it already has wrapped in it the nature of non-existence. So an object carries with it its own non-existence. So he's pointing to something more profound here. So recognizing it will cease is a relatively shallow way of approaching this term Nirodha Dhamma. The deeper layer is recognizing that uh, anything that is conditional is impermanent and contains within it its own non-existence. Is everyone with me? Is anybody not with me? Be honest. Okay. Um, I'll take you at face value on that one. So if you're lost, you're just going to keep getting more lost. Okay. We need someone to like hold up a sign that says laugh. <laughs> <laughs> we had this in a previous retreat. So we had someone over here that would, that would hold up. Their, well, it, was, it was an imaginary sign. An imaginary sign that said laugh. So everyone just knew when she went like this, that meant I just said something funny and you're supposed to laugh. <laughs> um. And so he says, uh, being stable in that perception, one reaches the elimination of the corruptions. So when we recognize that the experience we're currently having... Um, so when, when we first reach jhana, the first time we reach jhana, it's such a magnificent experience that usually it makes a very deep mark on the mind. It's such a significant departure from everything we've experienced up to that point in our life, that it makes a very sharp mark in our mind. So I can still remember in very clear detail um, the first time I experienced deep concentration. Uh, it made, the impact it makes on the mind is, uh, it's quite extreme. Uh, because it puts everything else in our life into contrast. Everything else in our life takes second place, at best, automatically. So then we fixate, there's a tendency to fixate on that experience and think, oh, this is the best. So when we reflect, even the best thing I've ever experienced is conditional, volitional, impermanent, subject to cessation, and contains its own non-existence by default. Uh, then we can extrapolate. Well, if the best is this way, and everything else is this way, then nothing is worth holding on to. Nothing is worth obsessing about. Nothing is worth clinging to. And with that recognition, then it's possible to let go of the entire mass of samsara all at once. And then, therefore, to attain awakening. So that's, uh, letting go is synonymous with attaining enlightenment. The two are not different. It's exactly the same thing. So elsewhere, there's a sutta where somebody asked the Buddha to sum up his entire teaching into one sentence. And the Buddha was like, okay, that's easy. Nothing whatsoever should be clung to. Did you get it? That was all of Buddhism in one sentence. <laughs> Got it? Okay, now just do it. <laughs> So the perception of impermanence is a way of helping us do that. When we recognize that all things are impermanent, insubstantial, uh, and empty of inherent existence, then we stop trying to hold on to them because we realize there's nothing you can possibly hold on to. I'll, I'll bring some more suttas tomorrow that illustrate this point more clearly using some really lovely similes. Uh, but for now, just focus on impermanence. Impermanence is the easy thing to get a relatively easy part to get a handle on. The deeper implications um, 
again, you can read about them, but where it really becomes relevant is through direct experience. It's through taking these suttas as meditation instructions and practicing them, living them, experiencing them, and seeing what happens. Um, or if there's some residual attachment, uh, and in this case, interestingly enough, what uh, Bhante Ananda emphasizes is attachment to the Dhamma itself, uh, then uh, you won't attain full enlightenment, but since you recognize that all sensual things are sensual things, including jhana, interestingly enough, jhana is a form of sensuality, it's just a very refined form of sensuality. Uh, so then, w with abandoning attachment to all sensual things, then one becomes a non-returner, uh, as I mentioned before. So a non-returner, one who uh, reappears in a uh, heavenly world where one works out uh, the remainder of one's delusions, uh, and eventually attains enlightenment in that world. Is everyone with me so far? Mm -hmm. Great, because the rest of the sutta follows in the same vein. Um, so then Ananda continues. Here is another one, householder. A monk attains and remains in the second jhana, the third jhana, the fourth jhana, so going through the first four jhanas. He reflects, this is the fourth jhana, it is conditional and volitional, whatever is conditional and volitional is impermanent and will cease. So no matter how deep your experience of jhana is, the practice is the same. You reflect on it, uh, this is jhana, uh, it is conditional, so it relies upon specific conditions, it's volitional, the mind has to be oriented in a specific way in order for it to happen. Um, whatever is conditional and volitional is impermanent and has the nature of cessation, has the nature of non-existence. Okay? Is everyone on board? Good. Stan, once again, is snoring through my talks. <laughs> it's a good thing he's not human, or I wouldn't let him get away with that. I actually did it one time when I was giving a talk, and um, there, there were people sitting in the front, so I couldn't tell someone was lying down in the back until they started snoring. <laughs> so, cats can get away with it. Humans cannot get away with it. Um, here is another one, householder. A monk dwells having suffused the first direction with the mind of loving kindness, as well as the second, third, and fourth directions. Above, below, around, and everywhere, impartially and all-encompassing, he dwells having suffused the entire world with the mind of loving kindness. Abundant, enormous, immeasurable, free of aversion and hostility. He reflects, this is the mental liberation of loving kindness. It is conditional and volitional. Whatever is conditional and volitional is impermanent and will cease. So this also is another way we can apply this reflection. So developing loving-kindness meditation. So bringing up loving-kindness, expanding it, uh, making it absolutely boundless and immeasurable, extending limitlessly in all directions with no distinction of self and other, to the point where there's simply one vast, limitless, boundless field of loving-kindness. So it's possible to reach a state uh, through loving-kindness where the mind feels completely free in this experience of loving-kindness. It's just an experience. It's actually quite similar to jhana. Um, and it can be a, uh, an immediate preliminary to jhana. It can be a, uh, a shortcut to jhana, if we can talk about shortcuts, because realistically it tends to be quite challenging. Uh, but this experience of the mind being completely free within this field of loving-kindness, once again, can have a very profound impact on the mind. So then that experience as well, we reflect on as being conditional, volitional, impermanent, and of the nature of cessation. With the nature of cessation, the nature of its own non-existence. And again, this leads to letting go. Uh, it's recognizing that even this absolutely magnificent, boundless experience of loving-kindness is also something we let go of. 
just as everything else. Here is another one, householder. A monk dwells having suffused the first direction with a mind of compassion, a mind of sympathetic joy, a mind of equanimity. So applying the same practice to the other three Brahma Viharas, the other three divine mind states. Here is another one, householder. By completely transcending all perceptions of form with the disappearance of perceptions of resistance, and by not paying attention to perceptions of diversity, per excuse me, perceiving infinite space, a monk attains and remains in the dimension of infinite space. He reflects, this is the dimension of infinite space. It is conditional and volitional. Whatever is conditional and volitional is impermanent and will cease. So here the Buddha is starting to talk about the formless jhanas, the, the formless concentration uh, that we can reach. Uh, so these are, are really far out experiences that it's possible to develop through uh, specific forms of concentration meditation. And again, they're experiences which often give one the mistaken belief of having attained enlightenment. No, or the mistaken belief that one has realized absolute reality. Um, but it's not. Uh, it's just another temporary experience. So you might have a perception of infinite space and believe that infinite space is the way things really are. Uh, infinite space is absolute truth. That's, that's the true nature of reality, is infinite space. But that's not true. It's just a conditional experience. It's just another impermanent, unreliable, unsatisfying experience. It's very interesting, perhaps. Um, I wouldn't know, I haven't experienced this uh, in my meditation practice. Uh, but uh, it's something to reflect on. Uh, again, it's just being another impermanent temporary experience uh, to let go of. Uh, so this translation, by the way, says, by not paying attention to perceptions of diversity, I would translate that a bit differently these days. I would probably translate that uh, not paying attention to perceptions of variety. Um, so it's not perceiving distinct objects within space. So normally within space we see like there's a person sitting over there and a cat over there and a cup over there and a cushion over there. So it's perceiving a variety of objects. In developing the perception of infinite space, we, we drop all perceptions of objects. And we just focus on the space that objects are occupying. So forget the objects, just notice the space. And you'll recognize that the space extends boundlessly in all directions. Uh, and if that's the only thing the mind is fixated on, then you can enter into the perception of nothing but infinite space. So it's possible, and we can use that also as a basis for the perception of impermanence. Um, anyone here currently meditating on infinite space? Anyone? No? Didn't think so. What is it? Okay, yeah, don't worry about it. I mean, realistically, you can't even get to the perception of infinite space unless you've already made it to fourth jhana. Most people are still struggling just to get first jhana. So, these are included for the sake of completeness, but they're not terribly relevant to most of us. But it's mentioned because if we do have these experiences, then we'll recognize them for what they are, and we can then use them as a basis for the development of insight meditation, as laid out in the sutta. So Ananda continues, Here is another one, by completely transcending the dimension of infinite space, perceiving infinite consciousness, one attains and remains in the dimension of infinite consciousness, um, and applies the same practice. By completely transcending the dimension of infinite consciousness, perceiving nothing existing, a monk attains and remains in the dimension of nothingness. He reflects, this is the dimension of nothingness, it is conditional and volitional, whatever is conditional and volitional is impermanent and will cease. It's worth pointing out that the perception of nothingness is not the same as the perception of emptiness. So the uh, emptiness is not nothingness. I'll talk about this in more detail tomorrow. Uh, emptiness could be more accurately described as infinite potentiality. It is not accurate to call it nothingness. So I'll explain this in more detail tomorrow, but just for now, just making that clear distinction. Nothingness is not emptiness. Emptiness is not nothingness. They're two different concepts. 
Um, but it is possible through meditation to reach a point where you perceive absolutely nothing existing except yourself, except your own perception. There still has to be me perceiving nothing. So at this point uh, in, in concentration, one is perceiving absolutely nothing, but there's still the experience of a being that perceives nothingness. So this is why it's, it's still an incomplete experience. There's still attachment to self. There's still a perception of self-existence. So we recognize that that's just another conditional and volitional experience that's also impermanent and has the nature of cessation. So we let go of that as well. Um, so then Ananda repeats again, uh, this is another thing by means of which a vigilant, ardent, ardent, dedicated monk might liberate an unliberated mind, eliminate all the corruptions that have not yet been eliminated, and reach the unsurpassable freedom from bondage that has not yet been reached. When this was said, Dasama said to Venerable Ananda, Bhante Ananda, it is just as if a person was seeking one treasure and gained eleven treasures. In the same way, Bhante, I was seeking one door to the deathless and gained eleven doors to the deathless that can be developed. Bhante, just as a person whose house has eleven doors can use any one of them to make himself safe if the house is on fire. In the same way, Bhante, I can use any of these eleven doors to the deathless to make myself safe. Um, cute here, by the way, that he's saying that samsara is like a house that's burning down. Um, we also see this same simile turning up in the Lotus Sutra, by the way. Um, this might be uh, the source for that. Um, we're all in a burning house. Fortunately, we have 11 doors that we can use to get safety. Um, we actually have a lot more than 11 doors, but here there's 11 listed. Uh, Bhante, members of other religions will seek out money to give to their teacher. Why don't I also make an offering to Venerable Ananda? Then Dasama gathered together the community of monks who lived in Vaisali and satisfied them by serving them many kinds of excellent food with his own hands. Um, just like she serves us many kinds of excellent food with her own hands. Uh, then he presented each monk with a pair of robes, presented Venerable Ananda with a set of three robes, and had 500 monastic dwellings constructed for Venerable Ananda. Um, so apparently Dasama was very happy with this discourse. So the point of this sutta, uh, again, is to point to how the perception of impermanence, when applied to whatever we consider to be the most exalted or most amazing experience we've had, uh, can lead us to letting go of attachment to everything in the world. Um, so, uh, realistically, we can apply the perception of impermanence to anything, and optimally, we should apply it to everything. But it's interesting that this sutta specifically focuses on taking whatever we've experienced that we consider the highest, or the most profound, or the most amazing, or the most awe-inspiring, or the most uh, impactful, and reflecting that was conditional, that was impermanent, that also has the nature of cessation. So it is not reliable, it is not a suitable source of happiness, it is not who we are or what we are. So letting go of that. And then from that, letting go of everything else as well, um, by, by inference, by extrapolation. Um, and so in our own practice, one way that we can apply this is through practicing concentration practice, practicing concentration until we experience jhana, or somewhere close to jhana, if you're not yet to the point of experiencing jhana. And then whatever experience we're having, we perceive it as impermanent. So, uh, it's given as a reflection of thinking this is conditional, volitional, impermanent, and has the, uh, the nature of cessation. But optimally, we're not saying these words in our minds, but rather we're perceiving the constant change. We're observing the impermanent, insubstantial nature of the experience that we're having. So that we naturally let go. 
we naturally stop trying to hold on to anything. Uh, we naturally recognize that there's nothing there to be held on to. And once we develop that perception in one limited area, then we can expand it to encompass more and more of our experience. So, just to use uh, the example of, say, mindfulness of the body, focusing on your hands. Once your attention is thoroughly focused on your hands, then start to notice that the sensations in your hands are constantly changing, constantly arising and ceasing, constantly coming and going. And you'll start to experience this perception of, of insubstantiality, this experience of, of non-solidity, of non-stability in the area of your hands. Uh, you, you, let, you can actually get to a point where the experience of the hands disappears entirely. And what you're perceiving is this raw potential of being, this raw potential for forms. There's nothing specific there. There's simply the potential for specific things to be there. So this is what we mean when we talk about emptiness. That's one way we can talk about emptiness. So then as we develop the perception of impermanence in that area, as it becomes well established, then we expand it. So expanding the perception of impermanence to encompass the whole body, perceiving the